Aaron's going to come read for us now. Good morning. John chapter 18, verse 1 through 12. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place where Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek he? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me shall not drink it. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that we're not reading these words as a spiritually blind man, that you have opened our eyes. We thank you for Christ, who is our justification and our sanctification. We uh, ask that you be with Brother Ken as he preaches, and that you'll open our eyes and our ears as he preaches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a portion of scripture that I have from which to preach for you today. And I've entitled this simply, Betrayed and Bound. That aptly describes what we see here happening to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, betrayed by Judas and bound by these soldiers that came to arrest him. And yet, as we know, Peter later declared there in Acts chapter 2 that all this was done according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that they took and by wicked hands crucified him. I believe that helps us when we read and understand what our Lord was going through here. Had any part of this been left up to man to determine it, it would not have come to the end that it did. This was the Lord. And all the while he was in the body of a man subjected to this suffering, yet he was all the while directing every detail that was taking place with regard to his betrayal, to his arrest, to his being bound, and then ultimately even his crucifixion. That's an amazing thing to consider. He never stopped being God. That glory was hidden in the flesh, and yet he was God of very God. God didn't die that day on the cross. A man did. But that Man, the scriptures say, a body was prepared for him. Here was God coming in the flesh, a body, clothed in a body as a man. That was necessary because that's who he came to save, sinners. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't put away sin. They were but a foreshadowing of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that when he came, he would indeed put away the sin. That's why those animal sacrifices had to be offered every year continually and every time they were offered there was a reminder again that the sin had not been put away but when Christ came and laid down his life that was definitive so complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death that upon completion of that work the father looked upon that shedding of blood unto death just like we read there in Exodus 12 when I see the blood 
I will pass over you. When did God see the blood? When it was shed there at the cross. Everything up to that point was in type and picture, prophecy. There remained nothing more for the satisfaction of a holy God than that Christ should accomplish it. So that's why I, I want us to read this portion and study it together, seeing God's hand directing in it all. Don't believe Hollywood. A lot of movies have been done about this particular period of time in Christ's death, and boy, they like to emphasize it called the passion and uh, the suffering and all that he endured as if somehow he was a victim. He wasn't a victim. He was a sacrificial lamb that God had ordained. That's what John the Baptist declared when uh, the Lord raised him up in the desert. Behold the Lamb of God. That should have caught somebody's attention because there were lots of lambs that had been offered up to that point. But the Lamb of God, this goes all the way back to Mount Moriah. When uh, Abraham went up on that mountain with his son Isaac. And Isaac asked the question, he said, Behold the wood and the fire, but where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? God will provide himself a lamb. Do you realize Mount Moriah is where the temple was built by Solomon? And years later, even after Solomon's temple had been destroyed, that second temple that had been rebuilt on those ruins, that's where Christ came, on that mountain. And that's where God offered up his lamb. Exactly as he foretold. You know, we're talking about thousands of years going by. And yet every detail down to the minutia accomplished exactly as God had purposed. So here in each of the gospels, they call them the synoptics because they're all parallel gospels. You can read different parts of what we're reading here just in gospel of John. But as the end of Christ's path draws near, that's really what we're seeing here. All that took place, all the prophecies that were foretelling, were coming down to this one moment of time. And here we find, again, our Savior. This was not a surprise. He wasn't surprised by these that came to arrest him in the garden. He had been speaking again and again of how he should suffer at the hands of men and how that he would be scourged and spat upon, be shamefully treated, not just by the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. And uh, ending up with his crucifixion and his burial. But thank God the story doesn't end there. As we're going to see continuing on through this Gospel of John, his resurrection and his ascension on high. We serve a living Savior who's in the world today. I know that he's living no matter what men say. You ask me how I know he lives, the song says he lives within my heart, but our answer is it's written in his word. That's how we know. Therein is our hope. But here in John, we see some thoughts that the Lord clearly gave to John that are very engaging in these closing hours as the Lord prepares to go to the cross. Everything in perfect accord with what God has purposed. It's interesting that the fall began in a garden, didn't it? That's where the first Adam fell. Where does this trial of our Lord take place? Who's called the last Adam in a garden and uh, every bit as much as Adam was felled by Satan's opposition and, and subtleness that first Adam you know that Satan was here according to God's purpose because it says he entered into Judas to cause Judas to do what he did every everything here that we see men doing in their Anger and rage against the Lord Jesus Christ is the spirit of Antichrist driving what they did. But oh, what a different outcome. This Adam here, the last Adam, they, he could not fail. He could not cause to fail. And thank God it's so. So nowhere, I believe, 
do we see the very supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ shining forth more gloriously. You might look at his life, and you might look at his miracle, and you think well, that's all demonstrating his power as creator, but for me, as I study the scriptures, there's nowhere that we see the very glory of Christ shining forth more gloriously than what we see here even in this story as they came to arrest him. And I know the writers, translators here, when, they asked, when he asked them, well, who have you come to, to seek? Who are you seeking? And uh, they told him Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, you can see down there in verse 6 of the text, John 18, as soon then as he had said unto them, you notice he is in italic. It would be better read just simply as it is in the original there. I am. I am. And as soon as he said it, they went backward and fell to the ground. That's the beginnings here to show us that we're not just dealing with a victim. We're dealing with the Lord. And had he so purposed, he could have called 10,000 angels, a legion, to, de to defend him and destroy the world. But that's not why he came. He came for that specific purpose of accomplishing the will of a holy God and Father who determined that sinners, wretched sinners such as we are, should be saved and justified by that death, his shed blood. Is it any wonder that we never tire of speaking of his death? and his burial, and his resurrection, ascension on high. This is all our salvation. Now it says here in John 18 and verse 1, that when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. So this gives us perspective here. They'd left the upper room and all of this instruction that the Lord was giving them would have been on the way to this particular point of rendezvous and uh, these when it says these words when Jesus has spoken these words it would refer back to everything that he had been teaching them all the way back to the institution of the Lord's table, the last Passover meal, all the way through his high priestly prayer. I'm not sure at what point he would have paused and prayed this prayer, but John recorded it here for us. And uh, therefore now coming to the conclusion. Every part of this and this is what I wanted to say. We talk about his high priestly prayer in John 17, but every part of this work is his work as a high priest. His interceding on behalf of these that he came to save. And again, Peter had to learn the hard lesson when he tried to intervene with his sword. Not only did the Lord say, put your, your sword up, Peter, this, you have no part in this. Man is not going to any, in any way add to or... or removed from the work that Christ came to accomplish on behalf of his people. They had to be scattered at this point. And all of this is leading up to this particular part that we see here. The garden that's mentioned here in uh, verse 1 would be the same mentioned in the other Gospels even though here the Holy Spirit particularly omits the name Gethsemane. You don't find in this particular scripture the word Gethsemane, but we know that reading the other Gospels, that's the place where the Lord was brought. But in its place, he mentions here the brook Kedron. And in the Hebrew, the name Kedron literally means dark waters. So, as you see the path of our Lord here, entering through this garden, where's he going? To the cross. He crosses this stream, it's called a brook, Kedron, a brook of dark waters. 
Now, that's symbolic when you stop and think about what Christ was entering into, the dark waters of his death. The dark waters. In fact, his death is called a baptism, an immersion of fire, whereby he would take on him now the sin of his people. Had Christ lived the life he did all the way to this point and then ascended into glory, there would have been no salvation. The work of justification, of satisfaction, of propitiation required not only a perfect lamb, which is what required Christ to be without spot, without blemish, but also that effectual death. The wages of sin is death. Without it, there would have been no salvation. How do we know that God was satisfied with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? In his life and in his death. Well the scriptures say he was raised the third day. The father would not have raised him. Had he not fully completely satisfied God the father. So even the name of the brook Kedron here is significant. And someone pointed out and I liked it. Because who do we have here? The son of righteousness. Sun rises in the east and descends in the west. It's interesting that actually at this point when Christ is crossing the brook Kedron, he was on the east side of the city, dividing Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. This is according to Josephus, you can read that. But it was on the west side of the city that Christ was actually crucified. So the Son of Righteousness is going to make in this hour, in this last day, one full cycle. Going from east to west, the setting of the sun. What's the setting of the sun of righteousness represent? His death. And then the rising again on the third day representing his resurrection. I like that. When I read that, I thought, that is concise. That even in the very moments of Christ, going from east to west, even as the, the, the cycle of the sun, as we see it, rising in the east and, and uh, going down in the west so it was with our lord jesus christ now again there's so much here i believe an entire uh, series of books could be written on this and you still wouldn't get to the depths of it but when it says that he went over the brook kidron i mentioned you notice it says brook this was a small stream but you know the reason why the stream was there this stream was actually the drainage from the temple. And it would have been reddish from the blood of thousands of Passover lambs that were slain. And it drained out down into this Kidron. That's why it's called Dark Waters. They were red. And they were red with the blood of the lambs that were being slain. They had to go somewhere. I know there were certain times where the blood was put in a bowl for the most part and, and taken in and, and sprinkled on the altar, but it wasn't all the blood. That blood that was shed, there, were, there was drainage from the temple, down from that temple, down that mount, down into this, what was called the Brook Kidron. What a vivid reminder, even as we see our Lord Jesus Christ crossing this particular brook where the blood of sacrificial lambs had tainted its color, made it red. What a vivid reminder, even as our Lord passed by, to know that in just a very short time, he himself would be that one shedding his blood. But it says there again in verse 1, there was there a garden. Again, John didn't mention this as being Gethsemane, but if you take the time to read Matthew 26 and Mark, you'll see that that's the garden. And it says here that this was where he met often with his disciples. So this was not his first trip into this garden. This was a place where our Lord purposed that he would often meet with his disciples and uh, teach them and even spend nights here. So it was a very familiar place even for his disciples. 
And yet, this particular encounter would be unlike any of the others up to that point. Because this would be the time then where the Lord would be taken, betrayed, and bound. That's where this is leading. This is the, where the story goes. And it would be a garden of agony. Again, it's interesting that we don't read anything in here like in the other gospels, writers, where our Lord is in agony as he weighed the cross and that we have that expression even if it were possible let not this cup pass from me our lord was going with determination to bear that cup of god's wrath on behalf of his people even while his disciples slept so at some point between verse 1 here john 18 and verse 2, because in verse 2 it just says, in Judas also. But you have to connect it with the rest of the Gospels to see all the other things that took place. Some say, well, why wouldn't John have included something that would have been so important as the other Gospel writers did? Well, each one wrote as the Spirit directed. And as I've often said, if something's mentioned one time in Scripture, it's sufficient. <laughs> And the fact that John knowing and having at hand the other gospel writers, Mark was the first to write, and then Matthew and Luke, John would have been the last to write, that it was sufficient. It's almost as if John was testifying to their word as being the, the same word of God that uh, the Lord was directing him to write. It's all God's inspired word. But we, not, we don't need to wonder, well, since John left it out, maybe it's not true. No, it's so because it's written in the other Gospels. But now, again, we, we read so quickly over this portion of Scripture that I don't think anybody, particularly Hollywood, could even visualize what is taking place right here. Because here it says, and Judas also, remember he left the, at the end of the Passover feast table. He wasn't there when Christ initiated the, the Lord's table. He was gone. The Lord told him, whatever you do, do quickly. So where was he gone? He was gone for this purpose, to receive actually a detachment of troops. It says, and Judas also, which betrayed him. When did he betray him? Well, it was all the way back in that deal that he made with the Pharisees. He knew the place because it says, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Again, this was not a surprise to our Lord because Christ said, I've chosen you, but one of you is the son of perdition. And yet, here was Judas that had frequently come to this place with the Lord Jesus Christ and heard his instruction, heard his teaching, just like he gave to the other disciples and yet remained unmoved. That's a fearful thing to think that we could be sitting here and hearing this glorious message pertaining to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and yet not be a part of it that it never have been brought into our heart, never have had our ears open to hear. Oh, we could tell the story, but may it not be so. My prayer is, Lord, let me be one of these that, like even with the disciples here, he did not abandon, but that he was pleased to draw to himself. But verse 3, see, here, here's where we need some help. You go back and look these up in your... Strong's Concordance, if you want to. It says, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. All for one man. And typically, when you think of the word band there, you think of just small, some small detachment that was brought 
but it actually refers to a large number of Roman soldiers because the Jews themselves could not have the authority and power to arrest. This had to be with the, the authority of the Romans. And then officers, that's where they were joined in. The officers were, were actually from the, the temple security force. The temple had its own security force. Now, why they came with such forth is not, force is not directly answered, but it's sure that the religious leaders and even the Romans must have or expected some kind of battle or conflict. They'd heard enough about the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a man that could raise the dead. We never know. They didn't know what God's purpose was with him. And it's interesting too, almost a mockery that here they come with torches and lanterns, man-made torches and lanterns to arrest the light of life. <laughs> how foolish to think these torches and lanterns, how foolish they must have seemed like somebody out here holding the candle up and the sun's up bright. What are you doing? Well, I'm out here shining my candle. This is a lot of mine. I'm going to let it shine. No, they... Uh, they had no clue. They were being directed by their own lusts and their own passions, but in essence, unable to be able to discern what exactly would take place. That shows they weren't writing the script. But the Lord never mocked them. He never said anything in a derogatory way toward them, but you can imagine him seeing this detachment it says here the band coming in that word if it's correctly used and i want you to get a hold of this picture here because this is not just some small group coming in contingent now and surrounding the lord this word in the greek refers to a roman cohort and a cohort had 600 men and then it was a cohort of auxiliary soldiers. A spira is the word that's used in the Greek. That one had 1,000 men and 240 cavalry and 760 infantry. That's what the detachment represented. And out of that now, these are brought. So they were expecting a fight. I don't know whether they thought the disciples somehow were going to defend him or what. There's Peter with his little sword. The Lord said, put that sword away. So when we see this, particularly with regard to this word spirion, which means detachment, it points to an entire battalion that was sent, comprised not only of the Roman soldiers, but also of the the Jewish temple guard coming to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where we find in verses 4 through 6 then our Lord not addressing the soldiers, but addressing Judas. He speaks to Judas and in a secondary way to the soldiers. Verse 4, Jesus therefore knowing all things, underscore that. How does he know all things? It's because he's already predetermined all things. That's God's foreknowledge. It's not that God looks down to see what will happen. He knows all things because he's already directed all things to their end. So Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, that would be according to the will and purpose of his father, he went forth and said unto them, Who seek, Whom seek ye? Whom are you seeking? And our Lord would have said this perhaps for two reasons. One, he was, in essence, by his addressing these soldiers that were coming, was directing the attention away from his disciples. When he steps forth, he does so as the advocate and defender of his people. He doesn't wait for us to take the lead and now he steps in. No, we find him here actually positioning himself between these that came to seek him 
and even his own disciples. And then secondly, I believe it's to draw out of Judas. He knew, he knew what Judas was, was seeking. But this was to draw out of Judas his own evil intent. It's just like when Adam fell in the garden and he came seeking Adam and calling, where are you? It wasn't that he didn't know where Adam was. He was drawing out of Adam his own confession that he's the one that had fallen. And that's what our Lord's going to do. He's going to bring every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that he is Lord. And they answered him. So they were well prepared already, scripted. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. This was the common name that Jesus, how he was known. And because the name Jesus is very common. It's like we have a Jesus today. A lot of Jesus is around. It was a common name as Jesus of Nazareth. Now that was specific. And it was a name of derision. And so that's how they identified him by, by his parentage. He would have been Jesus Ben Joseph would be the Hebrew name given to him. But rather than that name being used, he was identified by where he was raised. It was a name of reproach and derision. But our Lord took it upon him like a crown. He didn't halt from it. He didn't turn from it. That's an amazing thing when it says there in Hebrews, who for the joy that was set before him, but endured the cross, despise the shame and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so when they asked, Jesus saith unto them, I am. Now again, just put he aside. I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. Here our Lord Jesus is using that particular phrase or statement that maybe in English doesn't carry all the impact that we might think, but it is the name for Jehovah. It's the same name that the Lord told Moses when you go to speak to the leaders of Israel and they ask who has sent you, you tell them I am has sent you. Whom do you seek? I am. Who is this Jesus in the flesh? I am. And that's a study in of itself, as we've seen already going through the Gospel of John as we've been studying it, the various times where our Lord referred to himself as the I am. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the good shepherd. All of these things were to point to him as being God in the flesh. None less. And that's important for us because none less than God in the flesh could actually come and accomplish the salvation that he came to accomplish. So when he said to them, I am, notice the power even there. They drew back and fell to the ground. When, they, when we're talking now this band, we're talking about over 600 some soldiers. All of a sudden, with such a force falling back, not knowing exactly where that force had come, but the Lord knew. And uh, Judas would have known because he had been with our Lord all the way up to this point. And it was only now that the Lord was beginning to fully reveal his power and to show us, again, this is what's so vital that if Christ died, it wasn't in any way because sinners overpowered him or finally got the best of him. No, he laid down his life willingly as that sacrificial lamb. There wasn't anybody that took his life, he said. No man takes my life. I lay it down of myself and I take it up again, such as the commandment that I've received of my father. What a glorious savior that we serve. You think about Christ and that's how men would have perceived him in his humility. Here's a man walking among men. And you think about his humble beginnings as a baby. And yet, 
angels were sent to announce that birth. Today is born in the city of David, what? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There was nothing hidden as to who he is. They laid him in a manger, but the Lord signaled his whereabouts a couple years later in a house with Mary and Joseph had with a star. We find our Lord in his humility as a man even. You think about his path, follow his footsteps. Even being baptized by John the Baptist and John the Baptist halted at that thought and yet submitted himself to that water baptism. Why did he do it? It wasn't because he was a sinner, but he told John the Baptist so do that righteousness might be fulfilled. What was he saying? That it's going to be as this water getting your in and, and being immersed and coming out represents death, burial, and resurrection. So it is that righteousness would be accomplished. And oh, you can imagine, because as he came forth, the skies were open. There was a dove that came down, a spirit. And what was that voice that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Men might not be pleased with him, but oh, God the Father is. And you can go right on all the way through his life. Times when he slept in exhaustion. Yeah, he was a man. And uh, wearied. You know, tiredness isn't part of the fall. He wasn't a sinner in any way. But as a man, he wearied. And yet, when they woke him up fearful of dying in the storm, you remember? He was in the boat with them. Can you imagine how foolish that is to think that somehow they were going down with Christ in the boat? But that's our flesh. We don't see him as he is. And he got up and spoke and uh, calmed the winds. This is, this is the one they came to arrest. And maybe they had reason. Maybe having heard all these things already about him, they thought we better be, pre be prepared. But they could not have been prepared as God had determined. But even down to this, his humiliation. Is submitting himself to this arrest and yet declaring I am I love those words they're, they're more precious than ever who is he in those dark times when you can't even see him just know he's still I am and he's never abandoned any one of his own yes these would be scattered as he was taken but not abandoned the Lord would draw them to himself again. And all the way to the cross. He didn't die in defeat. But rather he died to defeat. Sin. Death. Satan. The world. And all of that he accomplished. And he did it willingly. But we're going to stop there and come back. Here in John 18. Because there's a whole lot more. We've just been looking at the betrayal. And the arrest part. But there's a whole lot more that we want to consider next time. We'll come back to this not be in a hurry.